By about 1500, the last farmsteads of the Norse settlers in Greenland had been abandoned and the last sparks of Viking expansion on these distant realms had been extinguished. In this video, we're going to have a brief look at what caused this disappearance and if we can know anything about it at all. When Eric the Red set out with his family and followers in the year 985 from Breidafjord and Borgafjord to build new lives in Greenland, it is said that 25 ships left Iceland. According to the Book of Settlement, the Landnama book written in 13th century Iceland, almost half of the ships that, that set out did not make it to their destination, which is quite a brutal rate of attrition. So the first known European to land on Greenlandic shores arrived here in 982 as an outlaw booted out of Iceland for murder. He had decided to find the land that a certain Gunnbjorn, son of Ulver the Crow, had sighted when driven westwards over the ocean and built a farm called Brattachlid, the steep slope in translation. When returning to Iceland, he managed to convince a bunch of people to tag along and live on the edge, quite literally. And if you're wondering why would anyone do that in the first place, let's read this passage from a source called the King's Mirror. You asked whether the sun shines in Greenland and whether there ever happens to be fair weather there as in other countries. And you shall know the truth that the land has beautiful sunshine and is said to have a rather pleasant climate. The sun's course varies greatly, however, when winter is on, the night is almost continuous, but when it is summer, there is almost constant day. When the sun rises highest, it has abundant power to shine and give light, but very little to give warmth and heat. Still, it has sufficient strength, where the ground is free from ice, to warm the soil so that the earth yields good and fragrant grass. Consequently, people may easily tend to the land where the frost leaves, but that is a very small part. North Greenland was never a comfortable settlement, as you can well imagine. There are two main clusters of farms, the eastern and western settlements, um, essentially squeezed onto the same narrow strip of arable land along the fjords of southwest Greenland. The Norse practiced agriculture, that means cattle, sheep and barley. It was possible but remained marginal as it was always vulnerable to climatic shifts. However, they did not simply remain subsistence farmers because Greenland's true importance actually lay in its role as a supplier of exotic resources to Europe. And chief among these was walrus ivory, the so-called white gold of the north, the material from which religious reliquaries, croziers, luxury gaming pieces and all sorts of ornate carvings were made in the Middle Ages. The icy fjords of the northern hunting grounds in the area now known as Disco Bay were home to walrus colonies with their immensely valuable ivory tusks. Greenlandic walrus has been found in places as far away as Kiev and Novgorod in the east, and there is quite a big chance that it was also being traded further afield to centers of wealth, such as Byzantium or even Baghdad, where Arabic writers used to refer to it as fish teeth. Walrus ivory was used to create extraordinarily intricate pieces of art in the workshops of towns such as Dublin, Bergen or Trondheim. We're dealing with high status artifacts used for ecclesiastical institutions, monarchs and other wealthy individuals. But walrus hide was also very useful because it was efficient in making very strong rope and it was perfect for seagoing ships. Interestingly, a new genetic study of walrus remains has revealed how central this trade was and how far the Norse went to sustain it. So in the first centuries of settlement, ivory came from, let's say, relatively nearby sources. We're talking about East Greenland and the waters of West Greenland. But from the 12th century onwards, because local walrus population dwindled, the Norse pushed much farther. More than half of the later period ivory sampled in the study comes from the North Water Polynia, which is a biologically rich but very perilous region in the far high Arctic between northwest Greenland and northeast Canada in the northern Baffin Bay. And some of it derives from Fox Basin, which was even further away. 
the voyages were very dangerous undertakings and we actually have reconstructions of Norse ships as well as sailing routes suggesting that only large vessels crewed by somewhere between 15 to 40 men could manage the trip and return in a single season. The expeditions required intimate knowledge of ice conditions, precise timing, and also a willingness to risk shipwreck or entrapment. That they were repeated for decades suggests an organized community-scale effort to harvest hundreds of walrus per trip. In effect, Greenland had become the center of what we might, might call an Arctic ivory road, which would have been um, an early global trade artery linking the high Arctic to the markets of medieval Europe. Nevertheless, this lucrative trade was built on shaky ground because from the 13th century, Europe's expanding Mediterranean networks began importing increasing amounts of elephant ivory from Africa and Asia. And elephant ivory was not only more plentiful, but also easier to carve, yielding finer details. It also carried this aura of exotic and imperial as it was tied to crusades, pilgrimages and long distance trade through places like Venice, Genoa or Iberia. As a consequence, as elephant ivory flooded European markets, walrus ivory lost its privileged status. Greenlandic exports still had some value, but the premium had gone. Now, paradoxically, at the very time demand was weakening, Greenlanders intensified their Arctic expeditions, venturing even farther to secure tusks. Actually, not that paradoxical because they were, in effect, running harder to stand still and still, still be competitive. So they were investing more labor, more risks and more ships to bring back a product that essentially fetched even lower returns. So if you couple this with Norway's growing monopoly over the Atlantic trade, fewer ships reaching Greenland, and also the demographic shocks of plague in Europe, the ivory trade that had once justified Greenland's existence was slipping away. This loss of economic relevance was a decisive blow because without ivory, Greenland didn't really have that much to offer to the wide world. It remained isolated with fragile agriculture and the colony's connections to Europe weakened until they all but ceased. The economic downturn also coincided with worsening environmental conditions. The shift from the medieval climate anomaly to the Little Ice Age shortened growing seasons and reduced hay yields, thus undermining livestock herds. And we do have zoo archaeological evidence showing a dietary shift, meaning cattle bones decline while seal bones increase. And this points to a greater reliance on marine hunting. Now, this adaptation naturally kept people alive, but also made them more vulnerable to fluctuations in seal migrations, for example, and also sea ice conditions. Meanwhile, Thule Inuit communities expanding eastward from Alaska entered Greenland in the 13th century. And they were a bit different because they were highly skilled in Arctic technologies. They had dog sleds, kayaks, harpoons, and so on. So they really thrived in such an environment where Norse methods strained. Contact between the Norse and Inuit was inevitable in regions such as the North Water Polynia, although the nature of these encounters is still debated. Was it peaceful trade? Was it rather conflict, parallel coexistence, or all at once, perhaps? What is clear is that Greenland was no longer a Norse monopoly. They now share the Arctic with people who are essentially much better adapted to this kind of extreme. Most scholars agree on the pressures the Norse were confronted with. Climate deterioration, economic marginalization, isolation, competition with the Inuit. The outcome is the one that remains contested. So the abandonment hypothesis sees Greenlanders as gradually leaving, seeking better prospects in Iceland and Norway, and the absence of bodies or catastrophic destruction and the disappearance of high-status objects from sites like Gardar suggest that families might have just packed up and sailed away. And then we have the extinction hypothesis, which sees them as succumbing in situ to stuff like hunger, social stress, or conflict. Here, the absence of bodies is explained by Christian burial or poor preservation, and the lack of boats by decay or incomplete archaeological sampling. 
Now, both theories actually rely on the same evidence. The difference lies in how absence is interpreted. So they have no boats. Well, either they couldn't leave or they left and the vessels weren't preserved. There are no bodies, so that means either they departed or they died and were buried. The evidence is just too fragmentary to be conclusive, which explains why scholars can tell such different stories from more or less the same data. What we can say is that the picture that emerges is rather complex. The Norse Greenlanders were capable traders. They were sailing deep into the high Arctic to secure ivory while also being fragile frontier farmers, increasingly vulnerable to climate and isolation. Their expansion was admirable, but it was also their undoing because by overexploiting local walrus stocks and chasing diminishing returns in the high Arctic, they tied their fate to this particular luxury trade good, just as Europe's taste shifted elsewhere. So once elephant um, ivory eclipsed walrus ivory, Greenland's economic rationale essentially collapsed. The disappearance of the Norsemen cannot be explained by this sole cause, however, it was the outcome of converging pressures, so deteriorating environment, diminishing harvest as well, political isolation, and also contact with uh, the new Arctic peoples. Now, while this story might look like failure, I think it's safe to say that it is rather a story of resilience because a few communities actually managed for quite some time to endure tremendous hardships, survive and adapt in one of the most inhospitable environments you can possibly think of. So I hope you enjoyed this video and if you want to know more about the Atlantic migration, I do have a full lecture about it, not to mention a lot of material on Iceland. You can also find me on Substack and please do consider supporting my history project either by becoming a member or a patron or simply recommending the channel to whomever might be interested. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.